Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. A new look at cancer in the United States finds that nearly half of cancer deaths are caused by smoking, a poor diet, and other unhealthy behaviors. I mean, it's a lifestyle issue sometimes. Sure. A study by the American Cancer Society found that 45% of cancer deaths and about 40% of diagnosed cancer cases could be attributed to what the authors call modifiable risk factors. Risk factors that you can do something about. That's good news, right? I think so. Along with diet and smoking, the study also cited sun exposure and alcohol use as cancer-causing lifestyle choices. Here to discuss lifestyle and cancer risk is Mayo Clinic oncologist Dr. Timothy Moynihan. Welcome back to the program, Dr. Moynihan. It's good to see you again. Great. Always great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Dr. Moynihan, thank you. So uh, lifestyle choices can certainly affect your chances of getting cancer. Absolutely. There are many things that are modifiable, so you do have some control over the situation. I know many times that people feel fairly helpless in the face of cancer, but there are things you can do to help prevent it, and that's Prevention works much better than treatment, so we would, love to, we would love to put me out of business and we'd love to see fewer cases of it. Uh, so anything you do to decrease your risk, I think, is very worth, worth, worthwhile thinking about. I bet if we were asking people a man-on-the-street type interview, they'd say, well, quit smoking. That's got to be it. But there's got to be more to it than that. It is. But if we look at this particular study, there's a very large study that looked in, at, at many, many uh, cases of cancer. Uh, and the number one risk factor or modifiable risk factor to prevent cancer is stopping smoking. That accounts for about half of the 50% of modifiable risk factors for cancer. So that has a much bigger impact than all of the other ones combined. So smoking still is the number one problem. So getting people to not start would be the the best thing we could do. Uh, And if you do smoke, stopping, because we do know that chance of cancer does decrease as you quit smoking. That's what I was going to say. For folks who are smokers, they maybe think, well, I've done the damage. What's the use? But um, it does improve your chances. Absolutely. We know that even within the first one to two years after stopping smoking, your risk of cancer does decline. Now, it never gets as low as uh, the risk for somebody who never smoked or was never exposed to secondhand smoke, but it clearly goes down. So it does improve your chances. It's not a guarantee. Uh, but it, it is very helpful. Are we seeing fewer uh, cases of lung mm-hmm. cancer because the the percentage of people smoking in this country has markedly decreased? Wasn't it nearly forty or fifty percent a, a few decades ago, and now it's down to what twenty percent? So I would assume you're seeing less lung cancer. Or Absolutely, the numbers have clearly gone down, oh, good. and 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 that does definitely correlate uh, in parallel with the use of cigarette smoke. So men. Uh, Peak smoking was a few years ago, and then when when the men stopped smoking or decreased their smoking rate, their num- lung cancer uh, cases started dropping within the f- next several years. Women, uh, unfortunately, have trailed behind that, and and their their uh, decrease is much less. But uh, we're starting to see a trend where w- women's cancer, lung cancers, are starting to de- decrease now too. Let's talk about you and I, the uh, Midwestern Minnesota winter type people and mm-hmm. Mr. Hawaiian Tropic over there who just got back <laughs> from a couple of weeks in paradise. Well, it, would, it was no fun being <laughs> over there, you know, with that ballistic missile coming oh, in from Oh, my goodness. But uh, let's talk about skin cancer. Because <laughs> although we look like we've been in Minnesota this whole time, he looks like he got a little bit of sun exposure. And it is, if I'm not mistaken, that the cancer that's increasing the most Melanoma. Yes, absolutely. Skin cancer. Skin cancers definitely are in the in, on the increase, and a lot of that is due to uh, sun exposure, and so that is clearly a modifiable risk factor. That doesn't mean you can't be out in the sun. So it's okay to be in Hawaii. And it's okay to be out in the sun, but you need to do it sensibly. Uh, try to avoid blistering burns, particularly using using sunblock, using uh, clothing to block your the, the effects of sun. So again, in in reasonable doses, it's fine. Uh, but uh, there is an excess of skin e- exposure to that. That still is, is, is a small factor, but it's a very important factor for development of skin cancer. And melanoma can be a very difficult cancer to treat, especially if it spreads. There are some new treatments for it, which are very fortunate to have, and they're showing some very good responses. You'd be much better served to not get it in the first place. How does alcohol affect cancer risk? Mm-hmm. Alcohol affects multiple different forms of cancer. Uh, it affects liver cancer, stomach cancers, uh, uh, 
mouth and throat cancer. There's multiple different forms of cancer that it, it, it does affect. It also can act in conjunction with cigarette exposure. The, the two of those two, those two put together increase your risk more than either one alone. Mm. Right? Uh, but it in and of itself is, is a risk factor for multiple different forms of cancer. So again, in moderation, there's good things to alcohol. Uh, in excess, it definitely can cause a problem. You say good things to alcohol. You mean the effect on your coronary arteries? It r- reduces your chances of a heart attack? Yes. So, so there are some, so, some diseases where it can be very helpful. Um, again, uh, you know, when taken in moderation. Again, when, as in everything in life, when they're taken to excess, there's always problems. All right. Well, that's there's some good news. I mean, we thought news. you'd all have all bad news for no, us. Well, but uh, so we've talked about the the sun and the increase in uh, uh, skin cancer. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've talked about smoking. Everybody knows about that uh, relationship. Um, obesity. Mm-hmm. That's a, a risk factor for certain cancers too, isn't it? Absolutely is, and it does happen to be a bigger risk factor for women than for men. Mm-hmm. Okay. And it probably has to do with hor- changes in hormonal levels in the body, and that may be more uh, important for women than for men. But there are cancers of the uterus, uh, uh, of the breast, uh, of other things. But also men who are obese do have a higher risk of cancer too. Uh, again, it's not as dramatic as for women. But uh, some, some of the things, things go together. Uh, a poor diet, especially diet high in fats, which often goes along with obesity, Lack of physical activity, which mm-hmm. often goes along with obesity, uh, a, a sedentary lifestyle, um, uh, these all act together and uh, as a combination uh, clearly increase your risk of multiple different types of cancer. Um, what about uh, diet? Is there such a thing as a cancer prevention diet? Um, there are diets that are associated with a higher risk of getting cancer. We're not sure that there's any one diet that will prevent cancer. Okay. Uh, again, diets that are very high in fat, high in uh, 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 meat, especially processed meats, uh, high in uh, meats that are charred or uh, charred broiled. Uh, again, if it's excessive in those re- regards, those people do have a higher risk of various types of cancers, stomach cancer, colon cancer, uh, uh, breast cancer, uh, others. Um, uh, again, in moderation, these things are probably reasonable to have but it probably shouldn't be every meal you're having processed meats or every meal you're having uh, high fat content. Uh, We also are learning more about high fiber diets. They may be protective against colon cancer and other types of cancer. Um, And um, uh, diets that are lacking in fruits and vegetables uh, probably contribute to a higher risk of cancer. What about uh, vitamins and supplements? Are there Mm -hmm. any that will truly prevent cancer? Very controversial subject, uh, as all of so these subjects are. that's why we're asking the Mayo Clinic experts. Absolutely. <laughs> so there are some data that suggest that people with low vitamin D, but again, this is very controversial. If that has an effect, again, it's a very small effect. Okay? Um, but there are several studies that suggest that lack of uh, attainment of appropriate balance of vitamins and minerals may have some modest effect. Again, it's nowhere near the impact that either sun exposure or cigarette smoking would have, but there are some. There, there are some. There is a role for a, a good balanced diet that's high in fruits and vegetables. All right, we're talking about lifestyle and the risk of cancer in the United States with Mayo Clinic oncologist Dr. Timothy Moynihan. Time for a short break. When we come back, debunking cancer myths. Here's one myth or matter of fact: eating sugar will make my cancer worse. We'll find out. Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McCrae. And we're talking about cancer with a Mayo Clinic expert, oncologist, Dr. Timothy Moynihan. We've talked about the effect of lifestyle on your risk of getting cancer. And now it's time to debunk some cancer myths. Start with your sugar one. Yeah, eating sugar will make my cancer worse. Is that a myth or a fact, Dr. Moynihan? Um, It is mostly a myth. Uh, There are some interesting uh, observations. That's what's known as the Warburg effect. And this was actually described by Dr. Warburg in the early 1900s. And certainly we do know that cancer cells do use sugar to operate. And uh, they may preferentially use sugar, and they may not have the ability to utilize fats or other sources of energy as well. 
whether or not cancers actually grow faster on sugar is unknown in the human body. Again, in, in a culture dish, they may grow a little bit faster. But does that have any effect on actual humans in, uh, uh, as we see it? And again, there's not, not good data that supports that. Uh, so we can't come and recommend that you should have a sugar avoidance diet just to try and prevent cancer. Again, there's lots of other health implications of excess sugar intake, uh, diabetes, obesity, heart disease, uh, et cetera. Um, but how much of an effect that ha actually has on, on cancer is uncertain. So again, I think the key thing is to make sure there's a balance. There's nothing wrong with having that occasional chocolate chip cookie or bowl of ice cream. You shouldn't have that at every single meal <laughs> and it shouldn't be the only things you eat. If, if that's all you're doing, that's bad for a lot of other reasons. I wouldn't have cancer as the driving reason for me to not eat that type of a diet. And there isn't good evidence that if you do have cancer, you ought to avoid sugar. Right. At this time, no. Again, I think, uh, again, I would strive for the balance rather than the uh, uh, absolute avoidance of one thing or another. All right. Next one. Most cases of cervical cancer are caused by a virus that is sexually transmitted. Myth or matter of fact? I think it is a matter of fact. So uh, it looks like cervical cancer is mostly attributable to what's known as the human papilloma virus. Uh, and virtually uh, 100% of uh, cervical cancers in the United States, you can find traces of the human papilloma virus. All right, but important to also note there's a vaccine for that. There now. is a vaccine for that, and that's been very important. And we very strongly encourage people to get that vaccine, both young boys and young girls, because although the cervical cancer only affects young girls, the way they get it is from young boys. Yeah. And so if we can prevent it in both, uh, the, the boys are the ones who deliver it, the girls are the ones who suffer the consequences. We also know, though, that penile cancer, which does occur, it's fairly rare, but it does occur, is almost always associated with human papillomavirus. Mm -hmm. And so we could prevent that also. Uh, most people are not familiar with the fact that penis cancer does occur. And it can be a very devastating, difficult thing to treat, just as cervical cancer can be very difficult to treat. Don't even want to think about the treatment. Don't even want to think about the treatment. All right, two doses uh, for the cervical cancer vaccine, the HPV vaccine, two yes. doses, boys and girls, before they become sexually active. Yes, we, that, that is the current recommendation. Unfortunately, the uptake on that is only about uh, 40 to 50 percent of girls get that as recommended, and boys get it even less even on a 20 to 25 percent range in spite of these strong recommendations to get that as part of your routine immunizations. Yeah, it is a cancer prevention vaccine. Absolutely. All right, how about this one? Treating cancer with surgery causes it to spread throughout the body. That's old school thinking, isn't it? That is, and as far as we know, that doesn't seem to occur. Now, there are certain individual cases where certain types of an operation can seed a local area, but in general, that uh, most cancer operations do not cause it to spread. And our best understanding of cancer right now is usually by the time we have found it, even before it's operated on, there probably are microscopic seeds that have already flown off and landed in other parts of the body that then emerge at a later date. Right. Yeah, we do know that surgery will not cause cancer to spread. Nor do we think that exposing cancer to the air will make it grow or no. spread. There's no reason to think that that happens. All right, next up, cell phones can cause brain cancer. Ah. This is something that's been out there a long time. Uh, and now, uh, one of the things that we notice, we don't think that that truly happens. There are some animal models that suggest that there may be a link. However, if we, if we think about it, the first license for a cell phone company was for Motorola in 1985. So prior to 1985, there were no cell phones around. There were zero. Now, everybody has three cell phones and everybody uses them <laughs> continuously. If cell phones truly caused brain cancers, we would have seen a huge spike in the number of brain cancers. But if we look and compare the number of brain cancers we see today to back in the 1960s, there's no difference. So why aren't we seeing a difference if it was truly causing it? Now, again, that's not the entire story. Uh, we're going to learn more as we go. But as of right now, there's no data in people that suggests that use of cell phones causes brain cancer. I would, how about living in a polluted city is a greater risk for lung cancer? Absolutely. There are more and more data emerging, especially from some of the emerging third world countries, India and other places, where there are very large uh, pollution problems. And we know that those people, non-smokers who live in those highly polluted cities, 
do have a higher incidence of lung cancer. Mm -hmm. So it's not just smoking. Air pollution does cause it. It's much less of an effect when compared to smokers, but there is clearly some effect there. So, yes, living in a highly polluted area is associated with lung cancer. You know, it's cold here, but the air is pretty clear. (laughs) That's true. (laughs) Breast implants can raise your cancer risk. A a very good question. Um, As a general, we would say no. However, there have been recent reports of a very extraordinarily rare form of breast cancer called large anaplastic uh, lymphoma that seems to be associated with a particular type of breast implants. Really? This is associated with the type of uh, implants known as textured implants. This is such a rare cancer though, even seeing a few excess cases raises our suspicion. It's not a breast cancer, it's a lymphoma. It's actually a lymphoma that occurs in the breast. Oh, okay. So now uh, lymphomas Hmm. come from our lymphocytes, which is a type of white blood cell that circulates throughout our whole body. They live a lot in the lymph nodes, but they also still circulate throughout the whole body. So every tissue in your body has some of these lymphocytes. For some reason, there has been this little spike in these kinds of uh, breast lymphomas that are seen in association with this particular type of textured breast implant. Now, again, it's very, very rare, extraordinarily rare, but it seems like there's a little blip of it. But for regular breast cancer, no, there's no link to regular breast cancer. Uh, but to the, only to this extraordinarily rare form of breast cancer. Uh, most brain tumors are incurable, myth or matter of fact. Uh, yeah. Um, for adults, the most common type of brain cancers are cancers that started somewhere else in the body and traveled to the brain. So they're usually what's called as metastatic. And those are, in general, incurable. Then this, the most common type of brain cancer that actually starts in the brain is similar to what Dr. Excuse me, similar to what Senator McCain has. It's mm-hmm. called a glioblastoma, and unfortunately, those types of brain cancers do have to be considered incurable. They can be treated, they can be made better. People live longer with the treatments, but unfortunately, they tend to always recur. So most types of brain cancer, unfortunately, we do have to consider incurable. There are exceptions to that. There are benign types of brain cancer, such as meningiomas and some other things that can be cured, but that's a minority of brain cancers. Is meningioma benign or malignant? Is it cancer or not cancer? There can be both forms of it. The majority are benign and happen to not cause too many problems unless it's in a very unusual location that cannot be reached surgically or by some other means. There are malignant forms of meningioma. These are extraordinarily rare, but they do occur. All right, a lot of myths that we have debunked with the Mayo Clinic expert oncologist, Dr. Timothy Moynihan. Thanks so much for being with us. Always a pleasure to be with you.